the Q&A, not just the chat. Here we go. Go into webinar mode. And we have a bunch of people coming in. So uh, uh, for panelists, if you want to see who's in, you can go to um, the attendees list. You, you click on um, participants, and then you can see attendees. So welcome, everybody. We're going to give it a couple minutes before we get started, just to you know, not, not go too far in before, we, before we, uh, we have most folks. This is being recorded, and we will field questions either in the chat or the Q&A. I will have both up. Um, and there will also be time for questions at the end. And you guys can see the presentation, right? I am actually sharing my screen. Always worth checking. I don't have a gold border today. All right, we will give it one more minute if you just joined. Um, give it one more minute and get kicked off and then people are late. Well, they missed the best content, I'm sure. All right, I'm going to kick it off. We're going to roll into introductions, and we'll we'll see uh, again. People just won't know who we are if they're talking to us. Uh, general note: if you have questions, put it in the Q and A or the chat. I'll monitor both, and uh, we'll answer them live where we can. And we will uh, hold longer, longer or deeper, deeper cycle questions until we until we get uh, get to the Q and A at the end. I am Ben Rausch, principal in charge of high performing building and energy modeling and commissioning and a bunch of other things at, fire, at uh, FSI engineers. Um, and I'm excited to be here. Matthew? Yeah, my name is Matthew Velos. I'm the sustainability project manager at FSI engineers. I spend a lot of time energy modeling um, and building energy kind of analyses. I also spend a bit of time working with advocacy groups on decarbonization and a just energy transition. Great. I'm Lisa Ferretto. I'm the Sustainability Director at Hord Copeland Moft in Baltimore. Um, I work on the integration of sustainability throughout process and projects. I'm also a member of the Baltimore Sustainability Commission. Whoop, sorry. Jay? Hi, my name is Jason. Um, I am the principal and founder of J. Neal Design, um, which is a firm that is located in OpenWorks and uh, prides ourselves in being fabricators as much as architects. And we are currently are working on a community land trust project that is going to be Passive House certified and provide uh, 10 units of affordable housing at 50% AMI for ownership. So I'm going to be here talking about some of our processes for that um and where we've gotten so very much looking forward to it thank you for attending uh so the quick bona fides why should you listen to us we we fsi have done 200 plus energy models for a whole lot of high performing programs we've, we've gotten pretty pretty deep into process and have given it a tremendous amount of thought which is why i'm going to show you our cartoon drawing next um this is how one of our energy modelers explained what their job is as an engineer and energy modeler to their four-year-old. So energy inputs, energy outputs, building, you know, heat leaks this way and you get heat in this other way. Um, these are the power sources. So when you get into energy models, what it really comes down to is what you gotta know when you start, what are you using them for? Is it, is it code compliance? Is it predictive of, of energy savings um, with a big old caveat that we can never promise energy savings? We've got this great thing in our, um, in our, uh, in our contracts that, that 
that tell you that we're not going to promise this result. Um, and then all of these other inputs and relationship between interactive parts, it really matters starting right up front. What are you going to use this thing for? Uh, we'll talk a little later about weather data. Um, we can dive into climate change and weather data in the, in the Q&A if you want to. Um, what we most of the time are using these for is a lead rating, uh, code compliance, grant and rebates, um, or for our most progressive clients for multiple options, multiple models, really considering all of the things we could build before we build them. Every once in a while, we're looking for post-occupancy. What went wrong in this building and why is it using so much energy? Um, when to model, uh, Lisa's gonna have a slide on this as well, but it's basically as early as you're allowed to model and then continuing through the process. And a quick note, we're here to talk today primarily about operational carbon. So that's one little part, and I'll put my arrow over it, one little part of the overall carbon puzzle. Matthew's gonna touch on this on the end about some of the other aspects of carbon we can really be talking about. Zooming way out, big picture. This is homes. I'll also show you a similar thing for commercial. Um, we have not massively increased our energy use in homes, but we have very much changed where we allocate it. So our homes have gotten more efficient, more insulated, better heating and cooling systems. Woo. But we are now just burning it on our appliances and electronics. So there it is. We have to be able to talk about energy use intensity. And in the four bullets, the learning objectives, I promised that this was one of them, that you would learn how to proof or at least back check your energy modelers uh, models. And this is how you do it. It's energy use intensity. It's KBTU, a unit of energy per square foot per year. So on a KBTU basis, here's the CBEX data. If you're gonna screen capture two screens, it's this one and the next one. Those are, those are your screen captures. Um, CBEX data for 2003 and 2012 showing a standard average across the entire country energy use intensity. So if you're looking at, let's do this office to office, standard regular office buildings have an EUI of about 75. However, buildings we're building today, you can see there's that office again. If we're going to the 2030 uh, targets, we're 30% we're of that. So your EUI is really like a 28. Um, so if you're looking at your energy modeler's outputs, you should ask the question, what's your EUI? If your EUI is in the teens, well, great. You're about ready to be a living building challenge ready building. And if your EUI is in the 60s, you should really be asking why unless you're 24 hour occupied or healthcare or something crazy. Uh, for a regular office, if you're wildly off that 2030 challenge, well, that's probably worth a discussion for why that might be. If you get down into the details one level further, you can look at the space allocation. This is a very, very standard office-based allocation. Lots of heating, fair amount of lighting, other. Like I said, if you're getting down into the teens, you're really, this is from the ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guide for Zero Energy Buildings and our climate zone is 4A. If you're down in the teens, honest to goodness, you're headed for a, a net zero building. What their analysis says is if you hit a target EUI of just under 22, you could build a four-story building and you'd if you covered the roof with solar, you would still be able to be net zero. Speaking of net zero and something I gotta say now so that later on when Matthew's talking about it, 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 it has some context, we, really like to talk about fuel sources, not just the energy used at the site. And particularly when we're talking about net zero, we, we cross out that gas. That's one of those things we, we no longer wanna be putting on projects if we're gonna be talking about net zero or setting up for an energy, uh, you know, electrified carbon-free energy future. And then Lisa, I have to pass, I have to stop my share, right? Thank you. Okay, are you guys in my um, shared screen? Yes. Let me go to perfect. Okay, so um, I loved the name. I'm gonna go back just for a second to the title of this whole presentation is what are they good for? And um, I started thinking about why do we do energy models? And I wanted to have a slide 
that says to save lives. And I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, ben already started talking about energy usage. And energy usage is just going to grow, continue to grow by 50% in the next 30 or so years. Architects were responsible for 50% of the annual global CO2 emissions. You guys all know this because this is an AIA coat presentation. So see energy, CO2, temperature rise means sea level rise. This is a real thing in Maryland, one inch every seven to eight years. Bottom right, great mapping tool, and you can see the effects on our local community in Baltimore and across the world with climate change, climate extremes. Um, the AIA obviously has knows this is a huge issue. It's a health, safety, and welfare crisis, and it's our responsibility to protect our clients, communities, and our earth. Um, you guys all know about the 2030 challenge. All the architects on the call, I'm sure, have already submitted your data or are going to in the next two days. And as Ben said, this is really just about operating energy when we talk about energy modeling. The embodied carbon and the 2040, 2050 targets you see then start talking about that embodied carbon part. Um, this is the slide. The um, World Health Organization says we could avoid 12.7% of all deaths if we improve air quality worldwide. So this is sort of connecting the dots about what we can do from energy modeling in our buildings to the effect on the whole planet. Um, so again, this is that sort of that triple bottom line, the three-legged stool, reducing energy, reducing CO2, pollution, health risk. We can connect the dots to reduce health risk, reduce COVID risk, risk factors. And then the third part, obviously, is the operating cost. Um, so this means a lot for families who experience energy burden in Baltimore City, a lot for public schools all across the country. How can we save them money and make a healthier environment, communities, and people? So now that we're all on board for reducing energy, I often sometimes refer to it as the path to zero energy. And before we can talk about PV panels, which is the very last step, we have to rethink from the very beginning about this early energy modeling with orientation and mapping. This is just a generic made up um, slide about thinking back to architecture school and how the sun moves around the building and how different shapes, orientation, and mapping will affect the energy use of your building. Um, so we need to start earlier, way, way, way back. Um, this example, I love to give this example, but I hate to say that I couldn't uh, make the change because it was too late. We received the site plan on the left, a shape from the civil engineer. And I said to the team, I said, let's just try to make a couple of changes to the plan. We energy modeled it. We got 10, almost 10% better, but the site plan was already approved. We could not make any changes. So the developer thought they were coming to us early and we already missed an opportunity. So at my firm, we use something called Revit Insight. Um, if you've been in there, it sort of looks like this in the interface. And then hold on, let me move our little heads around here. Um, and then you sort of see all of the options. It already, I'm not gonna lie, gets a little confusing at this stage. You click on one scheme and you see all of the things that you can change. And this seems at first really exciting because you think, oh my God, these are all things I wanna play around with, try to make a more energy efficient building. But what we've learned is that you can get lost. All of those buttons that you saw, any of these, you can get lost in any one of them. And I'll give you just a simple example uh, with building orientation. So this example was a 64.9 EUI. You start sliding these little things around and it goes down to 60, but you, you're not exactly sure what you did. So what I tell my design team to do is to go back to Revit and just change the window to wall area ratio in Revit. So you can see here option three, option three window wall area ratio 80. Then what we do is, let me go back, sorry. I export this table and I get this Excel file. And this is what I find confusing about Insight. It gives you EUI mean, max, min. It gives you the cost. I don't wanna talk about cost to the client. I don't actually wanna talk about EUI at this early stage either. The 2030 number I think is what they think the 2030 target should be, which is fine, but I don't wanna use that. So the only number I can really use is this ASHRAE number. So this to me is that number that if that mapping orientation model was built to code. 
I then take the numbers from this file and put them into another Excel spreadsheet that calculates the percent difference. Because again, I do not want to tell the client the EUI number. And I have, and Ben mentioned this too, I have this disclaimer, analysis is not intended to predict actual energy consumption, blah, blah, blah. It's, an, it's a comparative tool to help the team make informed decisions. So this is the fun stuff. So we have a project, a brand new project. We have three different schemes. This is where it is most useful. Here's three schemes. And you try to minimize the amount of variables that you change. So this all window to wall area ratio is 40%, which is code. This one's 14% more energy efficient. Awesome. But say you know, this is a client that likes a lot of glass. You know they're not going to have just 40%. They might double it. I have my designers go back to Revit, quickly change that one variable, export it back out to Insight, and you can see how the numbers change. You don't always have a site where you can have three different, completely different schemes. Sometimes the developer has a rectangular bu building. They're going to build out to all of the sides and build up as tall as they can go. You can still use this tool. So this dark line represents 80% 80, 80 window to wall area ratio, no dark line, 40%. And you can see the difference. Look at this one, 18% less energy efficient when you have more glass on the Southwest. That makes sense. It doesn't mean the client may not pick this option, right? There may be a great view to the mountains or to the bay or whatever. The, diff the importance of this tool is to know that if you need to pick something like this, you're gonna have to make up for it in other ways. So just a few more examples and then I'll pass the, pass the slides on. Um, this is one where the first two examples were kind of similar. It wasn't really that much different. And then we took it again, we tried to optimize the amount of glazing and we got a 5% better. We then took that same scheme. So this scheme, option, option B, then became sort of the baseline. And we thought, well, what if we didn't have two towers? What if we had one? 10% more energy efficient. We ended up going with this scheme. Then that became the baseline code with the glazing and we could look at different options. This was doing for my design team if you guys take this scheme and increase the glazing on all sides, we'll be 10% less energy efficient. Um, next client, this is one uh, Ben and I work with a lot. Sometimes we don't see much difference when we do these, and that's fine. It's still an important exercise to do. Sometimes 2%, that adds up over the lifetime of the building. Sometimes we do five different schemes. Um, again, we're only trying to change one variable at a time to make that decision at that time. So that is early energy modeling. And there's kind of an imaginary line here. From this point forward, you, I then do detailed modeling with an energy modeler like Ben. And we look at envelope, systems, controls, and then finally renewable energy. And we get into all of the nitty gritty and the excitement of what makes up the energy use of a building. I then created an Excel file to sort of track this. So we'll just look at roof insulation. So what is the code baseline? Can we have, a, we call them ECMs, energy conservation measure that's 10% above code, 20%, 30%. Then we work with the contractor to get that first cost. What is that first cost difference? Ben and Matthew can give me something like, I have 20% energy cost savings per year, and I can talk about this in simple payback. But the most exciting part of this spreadsheet is the combinations. So the first combination is code baseline. And as Ben mentioned, you really need to know what you're comparing your model against. So it's usually this code baseline. You might have an as designed combination, right? Maybe you always do better insulation. You might have something that says best payback with the closest to zero energy. All of those can change depending on the, the goal of your client. Then this is something I might share with the client. This is the project as designed. These are some things that we're suggesting. And then just the big picture, what's your energy use savings? What's that first cost? And what is the payback? And this is my last slide. I just want to sort of tie it back together and go back to connecting this to everything else. Um, with that one particular client, we were looking at glazing. So we're talking about what's a better, right, a visible light trend, I mean, a, a better U value, solar heat gain. 
but that also affects visible light transmittance. And something like light affects the occupants, right? Cognitive function, their sleep, their happiness, things like that. So when you talk about energy modeling, it's always good, again, to balance it with the other values that the client has at that time. And then I'm passing it back to you, Ben. Yep, and I get to turn my screen share back on. All right, that should be back, right? Okay, so this is our scary long list of information we need to make an energy model. And uh, <laughs> I laugh at this because all we really need to make an energy model is some basic building geometry and some verbal description for, uh, of mechanical and plumbing and uh, you know water heating, maybe a guess at lighting. We can do really, really early studies based just on some, some very rough building geometry. But to finish that model, to take it all the way to a code or lead model, we really do need a big long list of things that lives on several different sets. It's an interesting one. For, interesting, it didn't forward on me. Let me try that. There we go. This is the software that's our tried and true that is what we've used for, I've used my whole career um, and is also phasing out. It's train trace. I'll talk about other softwares a little later on, but um, it's very much an old DOS based program. There's nothing 3D about it. And you put inputs in, you get outputs and you have to have the skill set to actually evaluate if they make any sense. Uh, what you're seeing here is more uh, IES based model, which is the tool we're moving to, and we'll talk tools a little later on. But, but Lisa covered this pretty well. Why to model? All the, all the reasons why you might. But um, building optimization and reducing operational cost is one we're really pushing for, um, and, and that multi measure study Lisa, Lisa mentioned. And setting up for success, what does it take to get there. It's really starting early, being highly collaborative. There's a lot of back and forth in this and including the owner in, in this decision, their project requirements. There might be a reason they need this building to lay out this way. That's awfully important to know so that you're not suggesting things that just can't be done. Um, Matthew. Okay, so the outputs can be varied and as detailed as we want, but we also get really easy snapshots like, like this energy model output report. Uh, it gives kind of a, an easy to digest, but also um, usefully detailed enough summary of a project at any given time of design. Um, the, Lisa mentioned um, uh, EUIs, Ben mentioned EUIs, and we get snapshots of that throughout the, the energy modeling process. We also get a sand key that shows us where fuel is going and we get a really good idea of um, kind of energy end uses. So what energy end uses uh, is the most intensive throughout a project, for example. We often put together reports or studies, um, briefs, memos, whatever we call them that can detail anything from just a host of, of easy energy conservation measures to full-blown, let's get the entire team on board with what's happening. They're really good for, um, for prompting early studies, but they're also good to make sure that the entire design team is kind of on board with collaboration um, and understands the, the impacts of, 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 of any given energy conservation measure. That slide that Lisa just showed of, of the interconnectedness of, of each kind of component of a building, these, these reports are, are really great for, for illuminating that. So specific to LEED, they have accepted software and I'm putting it here in order of rank. And a lot of these were built on this old Department of Energy core um, and, and it's very much antiquated technology, but um, Energy Plus and IES have really taken them and run with them and made them more modern tools. You could make an analogy between uh, CAD and Revit uh, for most of these tools to what IES and Energy Plus are getting done. Software not accepted by LEED. There's a great many, there's literally hundreds of software packages out there that can help you analyze all sorts of aspects of your building. And many of them are extremely useful for for studying 
various things, daylighting, shading, keep going, right? And they're, they're very useful for comparisons, but they won't give you a total building use in a format that your lead or code reviewer is going to say, great, that's going to work. So in Revit, this, this is an important one. So Lisa talked about Revit, and you can do a great many things, but there's also limitations. That's one of the reasons it's not on that lead list, uh, that you have, you are, you're limited to some of the definitions you can assign to buildings. Um, so that's that's your single HVAC systems, some of your lighting definitions. And it's great for comparative. And at an SD level, it's way more than you probably even need to do, you, as long as you're keeping it like for like, model to model. Um, it, it really helps with those. But as you go further on, like, like Lisa said, you really got to pass it to another software program, which we'll talk about towards the end, how you can streamline that a bit, maybe if we all play nice together. And then architects as energy modelers, this is, this is what we're here to talk about. And we have two architects actually showing you what they're using these energy tools to, to use. So yes, at an SD level, absolutely. And then for beyond SD into the design phase, we're, we're switching it over to Jane Neal, who's been doing a lot of very neat things for daylighting and, and shading. So Jane, I need to pass the screen share to you. And we have to have you unmute. Awesome. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. And um, I'll try to make this as concise and helpful as possible. I can't promise. Uh, it is, uh, we're figuring it out as we go as well, as we've been looking for programs that uh, we can incorporate that are something at the very beginning to start gathering the information on the site. Uh, and the building that we might be proposing um, and seeing what light does um, and energy do, do on a mass or a series of masses that you might be studying. So I just, this is, might become off more of as a how-to, but I thought it'd be good to show the general steps that we go through just to get somebody started about what, you know, how they might bring it into their process. Um, and I'll try to explain some of the limitations that we have found throughout it. And um, so just to start, I kind of, you know, you want to start, you have a site. Um, everybody has a site that they're, they're beginning with. Uh, that site is oriented uh, on a cardinal direction. And so knowing what that is, is going to be important from the very beginning. And we, we typically import our site on this for this example, I'm just importing Raven Stadium uh, to show how off access it is. Uh, when you can see, this is all coming from SketchUp and this is Safari is a plugin for SketchUp just to preface this, that it is, these are two in the, it all happens within the same program. And then there's an export at the end, which I'll describe, but we bring in our geolocation information right at the very beginning, know where we're at. Um, then we start to place masks and you know, those are based upon a lot of different parameters. We just named a couple, um, zoning usage, solar orientation. In this scenario, I'm showing um, a single family size dwelling and then, a, and then maybe an, a, an attached, even though they're, it's detached at the point, just envision this being a series of row homes. So there would be no windows along these edges. Um, that is something that starts to, you start to understand. And I wanted to show this because I, I thought it was important to show something that might be existing versus something that might be new. You know, then you're starting to say, well, how does this fit in the site? This building is oriented with its, one of its walls directly south, taking advantage of solar uh, light and evenness throughout the day. And this building might be something you just have, you just end up with and you, you have to start with where it is and uh, as an existing structure. So um, knowing how to incorporate or how to look at these things differently is important. I mean, obviously you'll have a lot less flexibility in, the per in, in an existing, but you, it starts to let you know how to very specifically place um, fenestration in, in an existing building. Um, and then with, an, a, with a new construction where you can really explore um, you can get a lot of feedback quickly on where things go, et cetera. So that's also the next thing. So is this the sun studies we typically do, we just try to take these models into the next stage, which would be um, 
bear with me, that would be something that would look like this. So we would we would quickly kind of just move through this and say, okay, this is how summer or uh, summer solstice, winter solstice move on this building currently. Okay, so it gives us an understanding where light's going to hit when. Okay, so and then we go back to this and. We're going to be from that information we're going to be really looking and what's going on in the inside and our parameters and everything else we'll be looking at where windows doors go etc and shading devices because we'll know where cutoffs are and etc so and with passive houses ben can mention i mean when we get to certain levels solar heat gain drives everything because it's driving peak demand because we have so much insulation that we're not so much we're not worried about as much about thermal bridging inside the space because we have the efficiencies of these really mass walls that so it really is important when you get into high high levels of efficiency that how light comes in could really uh, throw your numbers one way or the other um, and you'll see that the, the tighter that these buildings get um, placing planar windows and doors interior shadings yeah and then we open up the program uh, and we assign site uh, usage in, in, in layers. So with that, I'll bring up the program itself, which you'll open Safaro to look like a normal plugin come in here, you'll open this up. Okay. And then what will happen is you'll see and I just turned on the the the, the attached thing, uh, row home as an example to keep it light. Uh, you'll have a couple different um, categories in here that you need to first fill out. So you'll have the residential aspect, you know, you signify what your usage is, tell it where it is, and then you'll start to get, this is gonna feed into how the light's gonna come through and what the EUI of this building actually might be, what the heating demands um, or in cooling demands might be and how lit it is, daylighting. These properties are, all those numbers are driven by the background here, which is all the different settings and for the specs that you might have uh, for the project that we're working on. Like I have to set my own baseline off of everything based upon what we're seeing from Passive House Wolfie models. So I'm working back and forth with Trey and Trace with Wolfie and this to compare these the information that we're seeing. Uh, you'll get some baseline information here and then we go open up daylighting and then you're going to start to see these three options. We will typically set our time of day to be at the, the uh, let's just say summer solstice and we usually like to go with later in the day to see what the hottest part of the day or the, the highest part of the sun might be. Um, and then we'll go into, there's a certain categories, as you can see in here, we have that we really focus on our SDA and SEE, um, which, you know, our spatial daylight um, autonomy and the annual daylight exposure. So um, I'll put at the end of this, I'll put a link into a very good article that kind of goes on to those. But objectively, it gives you, you know, if you want to match, play the game of like, get this into the green bar, that's the best way to, to to look at this is like getting this SDA up into the post 60, 70, 80 uh, percentile and bringing that glare down as much as possible, which is what you'll see when you're working with orientations and with shading as well. Um, so the next process will be uh, after you set the time, then it's really is about um, making the modifications, going through, changing things, uh, adding adding windows, doors, moving things around. And we and you keep it really quite light with this. You don't, you, it's very planar. Don't, you're not getting into thick wall thicknesses. Uh, you can turn this off and on to expose the certain things. And when you're actually in the model, you will select the layer and then there, right click and go to and tag it as a, a roof, a wall, a window. You know, you start moving this stuff around in your own models and then you start getting new data back. And I just want to end it on this is like we started to see this information. Yeah, these two um, items are, are good information to see. Um, so we just I added here's one. Um, excuse me, this is the wrong one here. There it is. Um, this is the one that has no skylights. Um, 
and then this is the one that has skylights and some some solar shading and you can see where our numbers started to increase not dramatically i mean obviously we're starting with an existing building and so we're going to really have to figure out how to get creative with this but you can see where our daylighting has increased the yellow is overlit the blue is under is is adequately lit and and um, gray is underlit so we have a lot a lot further to go but you can see where we are starting from so um, as people probably know now if they're in a row home and they've been quarantined for a long time these houses are probably <laughs> darker than you probably expected um, you know and so it's really important for us to kind of be very specific and precise for numerous reasons especially as we're getting efficient with our energy um, and this I've found so far to be a good tool for these items to get us to a baseline. Um, I will, and after you're, you've gone through this process with the program internally, you can upload it to, a, to uh, so far as exporting or a platform where it's, you can really start to fine tune your models to tell it what it is to, to get your EUI down to, and, and for your 2030 commitment, so. Yeah, and what you're showing here kind of tells that that you're down in the into the teens, and this is a, I think a pa yeah, this is a passive house project you're talking about. So that's and this that's, is an uh, older model. Yeah, and we were pushing. We were like 13 when we were 13, 14 when we were started to get our models to sync. But we're still. I I will be honest. This has been a little bit cumbersome uh, to get working correctly when it goes to the exporting to the next level. It seems to work decently inside the program when it comes to um, exporting out the, uh, the, or actually keeping it in the program as, as far as the information that you see from uh, Safara's internal plugin. Once it goes outbound to the web browser, it gets, it, it, it's a lot more complex uh, and it has problems reading some of our models and it just don't underestimate the time that it might take to get those things cleaned up. But we're excited to see how far we can go down that other side to see how much they might align uh, with passive house techniques to see if we can get them relatively close to being able to trust. And um, so that's where we are currently. You couldn't do a better transition to what we're gonna talk about next, which is GVXML. Um, so let me go back to turning on my screen. Yes, that will turn off your screen. All right. So, GBXML. We we got a bunch of reasons why this is this was, you know, four or five years ago. This was going to be the way of the future, and we were just going to be able to share models across all these platforms, and it was going to be amazing. And by and large, it doesn't yet work. And there's a bunch of reasons why, and it's mostly from Revit. Bentley is kind of a, a poke. Um, and by and large, it's, it's Revit models that aren't built well. And so if you don't build your Revit model well, the Revit in-house suite uh, doesn't, doesn't like to behave. Taking it to a Sapphira-like platform doesn't behave, and taking it to any platform we can bring also doesn't behave. So here's a whole list of things that you end up with, but I'm gonna actually show you pictures instead because we're all visual people where you don't close ceilings to walls. You've got um, soffits in here that, that don't actually close. This light is actually a hole. And so when we bring these things in uh, to any other program, this doesn't show up as a ceiling. Most programs just say, throw up their hands and say, forget it. This, this room doesn't have a lid and it becomes an infinite room. So it, it very much breaks itself. Uh, common wall errors, you can define a wall, you can give a wall properties in Revit, which is great. And those wall properties can actually throw a real fit coming into other programs. So there's, there's something to know there. Um, that's part of the problem that we're having cross programs, all of, all of the programs we can cross. Matthew. All right, let's see. So uh, in these next few slides, I'm going to talk about making our tools work harder for us. Um, I'm going to talk about collaboration to total carbon and kind of what energy modeling doesn't do. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about operational carbon reductions and kind of dive into some of the optimization and ECMs that we're, we're shooting for. Um, now, the compliance two-step. So don't get me wrong, compliance is super important. Um, and we can't build buildings without showing we reach code in a lot of cases. Um, and, you know, compliance and energy code have probably gotten us to high performance buildings, but we can do a lot better. Um, oftentimes where we do have to, to build an energy model for a building. And when we have the scope for that, we can uh, essentially reach a little farther. And um, earlier, Ben mentioned a thing about predicting energy use. Um, energy models aren't necessarily made to predict energy use. And a lot of the reason for that is because we're not necessarily talking to owners or occupants. We're not building, we're not building complex enough models that take into account the human factor in things. Um, however, if we want to reach, uh, if we want to reach actual sustainability, um, we need to, we need to get there and we need to start building, I think, a better understanding of the models that, of, of the buildings of our projects, even if we're not building models all the time. I show this graphic from the Living uh, Future Institute because it kind of articulates that. It says that, that right now with, with buildings as we are building them, when we're meeting code, we're still doing bad. We're doing less bad. Um, when we look at high performance buildings, we're doing less bad than code buildings. Um, but we don't actually reach sustainability. Uh, we don't actually start mitigating climate change until we get to sustainable buildings, which is zero carbon, zero energy, zero water, and lots of lots of other things um, that are kind of out of the scope of this conversation. But um, but essentially, the graphic asks, what good can we do? How do we how do we build regenerative buildings? And so I say the compliance two step because again, it's important, but we can go farther. Um, by using the same tools that we use for compliance. Uh, and so going back to, to predictions, making predictive models uh, and understanding our buildings um, by the people that are inhabiting them, um, to get to these high performance, actually sustainable buildings, we need those predictive models. Um, we also need to verify performance. Um, performance verification, we're starting to see it in code some places, um, but it's mostly to get away with worse buildings right now. But um, compliance programs like the Living Building Challenge, they, they require that you show that you are, your building is uh, it's meeting kind of uh, net zero, if that's one of the goals of your building, um, for example. And then the last piece of this all is metering. We have to understand um, how our buildings are performing. We have to give ourselves the tools to auto-correct all those good things. Um, and then the last piece I want to talk about here, kind of where does energy modeling fit into kind of actually sustainable buildings is practical optimization. So there's two components there. We can talk about, I mean, with the tools that we're using now, we can have tons of theoretical optimization. We can, we can pinpoint the, the heating and cooling set points to like the degree, and we can change them seasonally with the tools we're using. But um, but we, we also need to understand the cost implications of that control systems. We need to understand what the best, what the kind of passive house level costs are for a building. So by practical optimization, I'm going to touch briefly on life cycle cost analyses. Uh, ben, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, I want to, I want to, to say that energy modeling is not capable of providing embodied carbon. It's not, it's not capable of providing a, a complete, a total carbon picture. Um, we need collaboration for that. Um, we hold that operational carbon piece really well, I think. Um, and architects and structural engineers, um, you and they, uh, we are holding the rest of that carbon piece by, by embodied carbon tools like, like Tally and like EC3. Um, but we really do need all disciplines working together for that total picture. Um, I, I think everybody knows here um, what embodied carbon is, but if you don't, it's the kind of 
it's the total cost of, of to the total carbon cost of a building. It's materials extraction, it's refinement, production, delivery, et cetera. Uh, and so again, if if we're actually going to mitigate climate change and if we're, we're going to, to do good, um, we need a total carbon picture. Um, ben, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, this it's got a little fuzzy after it's it stopped existing in my brain and I put it on the paper, but stick with me through this metaphor. Um, this landscape, this, this Monet landscape represents the total carbon picture. Um, and so if we are trying to build a total picture, we need a couple of different components. So this, this image that we're seeing in front of us, it has kind of a foreground, it has a base, the, the, the foundation, the earth, that's kind of our, our foundation, right? And then these structures, which sidebar, these are actually haystacks, but we're gonna imagine that these are buildings. Um, they kind of represent the, the, the architectural piece of the puzzle, which is embodied carbon. And then this is where everything kind of falls apart in my brain, but we'll just imagine that the, the background, the things in the background, they're, they're capable of change. They're, they're, they're always kind of moving around and changing with time. So we'll call those operational carbon because they're kind of time dependent. Um, can you go to the next slide, Ben? So we don't get a complete picture unless we have kind of a life um, a life cycle analysis. That's the, that's the complete picture that we're building. Now, if you're still with me in this metaphor, the LCA is built by this entire kind of landscape. We need, we need operational carbon and we define that by building energy models. We need embodied carbon and we define those uh, and when we, we find reductions for those um, via carbon tools. And then finally, we absolutely need a life cycle cost analysis. If we're really going to get that, that, that total carbon picture and make those reductions, we need to understand what's feasible for any given project in terms of cost. We can't, uh, we can't you know, optimize our building without understanding the costs of optimization, for example. So thank you for bearing with me through that mixed metaphor. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about the tools we're using um, and kind of exactly what we're doing. So earlier, Ben mentioned that we, we, we still are using Trantrace, but um, in, older, uh, in older pieces of software, we had to build um, comparisons iteratively and one by one. So I would, I would define a building and then I would change something manually, I'd run that change, I'd simulate that change, record that change, and then I'd do that over and over and over again. And that was kind of our, our old school, is that, a, that was like our old school way of optimization. Um, things are different now with the, what we're using IES's virtual environment, the VE, um, and the, one of the tools that we can use excuse me, is the parametric batch processor. And it's just one of the ways that we can get to optimization in the VE. If you look at the, the variable column, we've got a handful of different variables. We've got roof, which is like the envelope. We've got, we can examine the roof, external walls, glazing, et cetera. We've got massing options like orientation. Um, we've also got options like, like evaluating um, glazing percentages, um, kind of, if, if a thing sounds like you can automate it, uh, but we can kind of evaluate those really quickly. So um, once we build a model that is reasonably detailed enough for whatever kind of stage of, of, the, of design we're at, so let's hope we're, we're kind of in pre-design right now. And, um, and once I have a model that's, that's kind of internally QC'd and ready to go, we feel kind of confident about it which sometimes depending on the stage of design can take it quite a while. I don't want to downplay that, but once we get there, we can optimize and we can, we can get a lot of insight really quickly using these tools. Um, the, the, the model that I kind of use this for, it, it ran, I think a hundred simulations, 50, no, 70 to hundred simulations in like 10 minutes. So once we set it up, it, it kind of, it burns, the, the, the software kind of burns through these simulations, which to me is like remarkable. Um, 
So in terms of envelope optimization and lighting reductions, the envelope is pretty easy to, um, to, to optimize. Um, we're not looking at kind of massing again. So Lisa, Lisa showed the kind of different massing and organizational or layout changes. That's not something that we're really holding, but we are holding insulation, we are holding uh, reflectance, all that kind of stuff. Lighting reductions, the good thing about, about having, about evaluating lighting reductions in our software is that it's kind of connected to everything. And something that we're really interested in is HVAC and how the, how kind of everything is interconnected. Um, lighting changes in lighting power really do affect HVAC and we can kind of see that in a really detailed way here. I put HVAC optimization on the side because I did want to say that it's it's not as easy to evaluate different HVAC options. So like if I want to evaluate the addition of energy recovery to a certain kind of suite of something, let's say heat pumps, that's kind of easy to do. But if I want to take a look at the difference between um, let's say heat pumps versus uh, boiler versus geothermal, those things are, are still kind of, I wouldn't say clunky, but they require a bit more time investment. Um, they are easier because we have a lot more kind of stock systems ready to go. Um, but yeah, HVAC takes a little bit extra compared to the tools that we're using to, to optimize kind of individual components and parameters. Ben, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Um, so this is another tool that we can use. It's called Hone. And this is, it's kind of, I wanted to show this this tool or the interface for this tool because um, because the software that we're using is really powerful. Um, the how do I say this quickly? Our models take into account kind of everything. So if if we're looking at if we're looking, let's just say we're looking at a really simple building like a residence, and let's say we're evaluating a heat pump inside of this residence. Um, our model, we can kind of tweak and get insights into every little thing. So we can, we can, I don't know, tweak every single control in the heat pump and we can have kind of a learning building in lots of ways. Um, and I bring this, this piece of software up because we can take really deep dives into any parameter at all. So earlier we, we saw that variable list of, you know, envelope things, lighting things, PV square footage, but the software is, is, super beefy and what this um, this tool allows us to do is to basically write scripts for any parameter almost any parameter in the model for which there is hundreds maybe thousands um, and then set that up to give us results like to to kind of show us the the relationships between other parameters um, so yeah it's it's not something that should be done or that needs to be done for every project and um, uh, and certainly it exists outside of feasibility when it comes to real world impacts, but it allows us to, to understand the consequences of our energy conservation measures um, with great detail. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and this one's mine. So we're gonna spend the last two slides talking about future energy impacts, where are we going? And um, this has a graph of, this is Maryland's energy picture over the next 30 years to 2050. So if we choose today, and one of the most frustrating things we, when we're energy modelers, but not our own designers, when we don't hold both pieces, we're very frustrated to put in more gas buildings. And, and here's why. So a natural gas, even a condensing gas boiler, this gray line, a highly efficient boiler is gonna keep using and, and putting out CO2 for its entire life, out to 25 years, and then you put in a new one, you get to go again, forever into the future. Um, whereas if we pick a heat pump today, that's this blue line, we're already better than any other carbon option. We're certainly better than 100% than efficient natural gas. And we also know our grid is getting better and better over time. It's heading for carbon neutrality. And it's a little hand wave. I can explain why it doesn't go to zero if you want to get into it in the questions. Um, but there's also a cost impact in many systems of that gas condensing boiler over your electric heat pump. And there's certainly an energy cost impact with the difference. 
So it becomes very much a, a trade-off and a big discussion. And uh, a lot of times we're now seeing where we can make cost neutral or even cost benefiting buildings that are all electric over pulling in that gas line service. Um, and the electricity cost is a wash. So that, that, that becomes a discussion. And when we're only holding the energy model part, we only have this little lever to enact that change. Yeah, so the, the Rocky Mountain Institute, they've been doing some great work on, uh, on showing that kind of, that piece that, that electrification is in lots of ways um, cost effective when we're comparing to gas systems, but they're also doing some pioneering work showing that even with today's grid in many regions, um, we're able to, to save carbon over time. Um, but I, I want to talk about source energy versus site energy. So um, source energy is, it's like the great equalizer. It's like the most kind of democratic uh, descriptor for energy use. So it allows us to talk about energy um, uh, from our grid, essentially. So source energy is kind of, it's raw energy. It's the, the raw products to get energy. It's delivery, it's transmission losses, et cetera. It's essentially the if we describe our kind of operational energy in terms of source energy, it's it's our it's the total carbon cost for operational energy. And the the reason that we're talking about this is because not everybody has the same grid. Um, here in Seattle, where I live, we are mostly hydro, and that means that my source energy that that the that this one kind of descriptor is going to be a lot different for the, a, an identical building in Baltimore, where there's a heavier mix of, of gas and coal. Um, our energy models, they give us a, a full picture of source energy um, by region for every project, and we don't have to put in any extra effort. So I bring this up because um, this should be part of our conversations, and this is something that we should be talking about you know, in each project. Um, Ben mentioned that we don't necessarily design every project that we're modeling. And I can say from personal experience that, that mechanical designers um, are hesitant um, for very good reasons to electrify. It's, it's something that we know, and it's something that is tried and true. Um, I should say that at FSI, we... Um, we make sure our primes and our owners understand the value of electrification. And again, I'm not saying it's, it's appropriate for every project and that it's feasible for every project, but I do want to say that we have the conversation. Um, and what does this have to do with energy models? Um, data from our models um, fills in this gap. Um, and, and really, it's, it's the complete landscape of an LCA that's, that's going to have these conversations it's going to allow us to have these conversations um, but energy modeling um, source energy conversations decarbonization conversations um, essentially what i'm trying to say is data the data that we're getting from energy models um, they're really important tools for decarbonization um, and i think energy models are kind of the first step there all right and last slide before questions so this is a yes and, uh, and all of the tools we've shown you here are both very, very powerful tools. And as Lisa said, there there are also the potential rabbit holes and, and uh, a great self-awareness while you're using them is super, super useful to say, am I learning something useful or have I gone too far? And if you're not learning anything useful, well, maybe you're down the rabbit hole. All right, questions. Uh, and I've got one, I've got two already. So Peter asked early on, are we really using more energy for appliances and electronics? This is from the home slide where we show. So if you, if you take a look at that slide and this was recorded, so you'll be able to go back and look. Um, if you take a look at that slide, we are using about the same amount of energy as we were in 1970, which is great, but it's a higher allocation to appliances. So we are actually using more uh, plug load than we, than we did back when. And that makes sense because, you know, like the refrigerators got more efficient, yes, but, but our, our cell phones and our TVs are burning like 
the equivalent of our refrigerator plus some now. And our TVs are always on. <laughs> oh, so much. Um, and then Matthew, this is directly for you. How does the Cove tool fare amongst the energy modeling tools? Fair. Um, I think, I'm not sure if I pronounced it um, clearly enough or, or made it very clear, but the, the slide that I showed with the, the kind of super detailed deep dive into, into individual parameters, that's called Hone and it's part of the IES suite. Otherwise, I've never heard of Cove. Did I answer your question? I think Cove is a different tool. I think that's why, and that's not something I'm, I'm familiar with either. Yeah, sorry, Lance, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not I, sure. I, I can jump in on that one. We, I've done that. That's um, one of the recent ones that we looked at, um, and we found that it had some benefits over uh, programs. One, it's, it's pretty user-friendly. And it does allow you to provide different usages. So it allows you to break up the building. It was pretty beneficial from the same perspective of the uh, SDA um, and the uh, ASE information that we were getting out from lighting. Um, and they, they, their platform seems to be uh, in a state of flux, which I like. It's, um, so they can constantly update their program on the fly and, and they've been doing that. So, there's some benefits to that tool where I think it could be, it's allowed to be modified um, and keep up with current standards or, be, you know, and so I found that it had some benefits um, and I'm looking forward to going back into the, uh, the studies that I've already had, but um, it's a pretty decent tool for what it is. And, they're, and they have good uh, customer service as well. Hopefully that answers some of that. That was great. Thank you, Jay. Um, one of the things Lisa asked me that I put on the question because I thought it was really useful is how we are or are not addressing climate change in our models. And Matthew spoke a bit about operational carbon, thinking about that. Matthew, do you want to talk about weather files a little bit? Sure. Um, so two things come to mind. The first is that we can alter weather files, we can change our predictions, we can customize essentially weather files to account for climate change. And there are a few groups that are making, um, that are, are creating content like that, um, specifically for energy models. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is we can, um, we can make simple changes to the model to, I guess, account for, for, for heavier design days, heating or cooling. Those are the two things that come to mind. Yeah, I, I think it's important to say our weather files are all backwards looking. And some of them, like the data set only go, mo our, our most normal ones, the data set only goes through the mid 2000s. So if we have anomalous weather, and we certainly have some anomalous weather, um, for Baltimore, that's really showing up in relative humidity more than temperature. We've had some cooler than average summers, but they are just hella humid. Um, and some, some very cold weather events in previous years, not this year. Um, we, can, we can get those into the model, but on an energy basis, we'd really wanna look to where the future is. We know that we should have more warmth and more humidity as we, as we move forward. Um, Meg asked, Forgive me if I missed this, but how can multifamily projects with individual metering be reflected in models? Let me, let me start that one off. What's fun about energy models is that we get to define where the box is, where the box isn't. So if you wanted to do a multifamily building where you say, I wanna know how much this unit uses, well, we can define it as just that box. And we can put walls that are like adjacent walls and temperature controlled. Um, that's great, but usually we're much more interested in what does the whole building do, not each individual box. And there are tools that, that we can define, you know, this, this energy from this unit, but it's actually quite hard to break out just an individual unit's power thing. I'm trying to do that on a project with Jay right now, because we want to understand for the total solar array, how much gets allocated to this one apartment. And um, that, that's a hard question without break, break, breaking it down into individual little apartment models. 
I actually yeah, I, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I was just going to add it's a it's a good question, too, because often one of the selling points of using energy models to save money and is the benefit to the client. So if you have an apartment building where the apartments are individual metered, the client is has less um, will see less of the benefit because they will not actually see the the savings on their energy bills. The savings will go to the residents. So um, in senior living, where if you have a client that actually pays the utilities of all of the tenants, it's an easier sell than if you have a client where everything is individual meter. So that is something that we deal with on a regular basis of how do we still make the case without that extra data. And part of the way we're seeing that is, is structures where people are submetered. So there is a master meter that can net meter off a of solar, you know, solar can deduct. And then there's a, a essentially a, a metering system that is private that lives below that they use for metering and charging tenants. So they get the benefit of the solar, they get the benefit of the energy savings, and the tenants get some of that benefit because they're they're more efficient. But um, but then it all has to be on the private side, and you end up with billing structure, and it's it's quite complex for the owners to need to deal with that. Uh, there are no other questions. I think people could raise their hand. I should be able to see that. Um, I, um... I just have a quick comment about the, um, if folks are looking for tools to, to take deep dives and to, to learn a bit more, um, the, the IES, they have a lot of different types of software. Um, the virtual environment is just one kind of big thing, um, but there are lots of really fun tools that are accessible to folks. You don't need to be an engineer to, to use a lot of the, the tools in the program. And I should say that the, the kind of, the way to get geometry in there. Again, we talked about importing GBXML. Um, and so you can use whatever you're, you're comfortable with. And there's some really powerful kind of daylighting tools. Um, there's, there's lots of insights into renewables. Uh, there's, I think there's something like 20 or 30 different scripts or kind of apps within the VE that are perfectly acceptable to, to lots of different types of disciplines. Uh I'm going to finish it with Peter's thought and call it a day. So Peter said, you know, for 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 apartments, it's marketing. You get to you get to charge marketing dollar for that and charge a charge a premium. So um, it is a good point, particularly when you can monetize it and make that case to the owner. Uh, next month, we're going to be talking about community engagement and passive house. So I hope you get to join us for that. I'll make sure to send out the link, and of course, it'll be posted on the on the AI calendar here in the next week or so. So thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we'll let you know when this recording is up. Thanks all.